So Uli was born on a farm in Denmark, learning the ways of collaborating with nature, soil, plant, and animals from an early age. He started his uh, first company in the, at the age of 18, producing stabling equipment. He's been driven by continuous development and understanding of biological and technical interactions, you know, and how we can take advantage of that. His key competencies cover human interaction with motivation, the ability to combine different domains for innovation, new solutions, motivation and skills to handle complex interactions and research projects, and communicating that knowledge and dissemination of it uh, through education with technical and, uh, and agronomical sciences. Uh, he's been appointed a, an honorary professor in technology and intelligent solutions for the suitable soil management at, uh, at Agro ecology at uh, Aris University. I'm sorry, I kind of botched that a bit on you, Uli. But please join me in welcoming Dr. Uli Green. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that was a long intro. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and, and briefly, uh, I would say that the approach uh, that has driven me and why I think it's been extremely inspiring already this morning, I think this innovation approach, innovative approach on, on practical farming, I think it's really inspiring. So I'm extremely happy, happy to have been invited here. Um, and, and when Mel sent the program, and I could see this after lunch session, I know that's always a killer. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll hope, now see, we should hopefully be able to change into my presentation. Because I don't know that much about can grow, but I could try out, but I think it would. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> a title called Farming in the Future. I think that that's, it's always a nice, because guessing about the future, that, that can't be that difficult. And I really love the, the presentation that Chris gave this morning. The more you study, the less you find out you know. Uh, I have the same experience. So. Uh, that's why I have a lot of nice colleagues from uh, different research projects that has contributed to some of the, the inputs uh, I'll bring forward for you today. So but basically, uh, looking at myself, uh, I have the title of CEO. Uh, so in daily, daily life at home, I'm the chief entertainment officer <laughs> of uh, Agro Intelli. So agro Intelli being a small development company doing automation technologies for arable farming. And as, as just mentioned in the intro, uh, since uh, summer of 2017, I've also been a, a professor uh, at Aarhus University within sustainable soil management. So I think I've really been excited about all this focus on soil fertility, uh, how to really take care of the soil all of this morning. So uh, I hope this will be very much in the same trend uh, in my presentation. On a personal experience, I am a trained farmer. I've had my own uh, farm 10 years back. Uh, I farmed only roughly 500 acres. So something to get good experiences, I was doing it on the side while doing my, my other studies. So I have a background as uh, a mechanical engineer specialized in soil mechanics and agronomist and then I also took a PhD. Um, everything around farming. So farming is what drives me, and hopefully today that is uh, some of the ideas I'll be able to bring forward to you. When looking at the expertise, working with tillage, uh, soil compaction, and automation, I think is crucial, and some of the key technologies that we will see uh, really making a difference in the next coming years, uh, all within also a precision farming context. I know precision farming, we've talked about that for almost 30 years. And I think some of the things we talked about for 30 years and we haven't been able to prove why they make sense, I think there's a good reason for that. And then I think new upcoming technologies, which is also within the precision context, could be rather interesting for you. So my agenda for you today will be addressing the soil fertility, continuing some of what you've heard early on, especially looking at the soil erosion, the soil compaction as, a seas, as some of the main threats to, to performing the arable uh, operation that you are doing. And then coming into what is farming in the future, uh, taking some guess on some of the new technologies emerging that might be game changing in your daily life within the next five, 10 years. And then I think an important part 
as also having previous experience as practical farmer, validated technology. Um, of course, now I'm coming as a, a commercial person, so I could sell you a whole bunch of things. And I know a lot of people within marketing are good at selling. Um, and that's where the important message in this, and what we'll show some examples, is that when you're out investing, uh, make sure that you're not only listening to the salespersons, sometimes also checking out uh, how this technology has actually been validated, because you're the one taking the risk with your investment. So I think that will be my closing remarks going through some of these points. Looking at the soil fertility, we've actually seen this drawing now a couple of times during the morning, and I think it's extremely important that even as engineers or development uh, people, that having an understanding of the system, the system which we are looking into. And that's really where it makes the skilled farmer understanding what is happening in this system. Uh, so we have a number of good examples during the morning on this. And I think that is at least why I brought it in the presentation also, because I think that is really where you are uh, also now talking about medal winning the understanding as practical farmer of this complex interaction. That is what makes a good farmer, being able to know uh, what is happening and when you're doing any effect to the system, what is the consequence, consequence of that. So, so soil fertility, um, I think one of the most important things is that we can't take it for granted. Uh, soil fertility comes at hard work. Uh, if you're just doing the, the lazy approach, we will destroy our soils. Um, now I'm coming from a part in Denmark, uh, in the western part of Denmark, where we have a lot of sand. So we have immediate payback uh, from modern nature if we're not able to take care of our soils. So the erosion aspects are really something that can destroy many years of hard work if we just, in a, in a single growing season, have missed out on making sure we have plant coverage at the right time. So, to be able to really understand this soil fertility, uh, also in the engineering context, that is an aspect of understanding the entire system. Um, and that is the craft that makes the good farmers as you are, and that, that is really why I find it very inspiring. Now we were in the first breakout session. I think this enthusiasm that you're demonstrating uh, is extremely inspiring to look at how can we then also look ahead in the future and become even more competitive and robust in our production. Unfortunately, then, I'm always having a camera in my car. So, um, occasionally you find such a field. I don't know, I, I would never see that around here. But in Denmark, um, in such a wet harvest, so there's at least one farmer that found out he wasn't growing rice at that point. But you see it all along. So, how is it we're taking care of it? As being a farmer, looking at these pictures, you have to see, ah, that's not right. But again, looking at your own fields, you know, okay, there might be some times where you, you are evaluating what is the value of this versus going around, so can I leave it, or what would be the cost, what is the potential of going out there gathering it right now, or sh would it actually make more sense for my own system just leaving it out there and then retilaging next year to find out if, if you can reuse your na uh, natural resources in a better way. Because no doubt that the compaction done in this is significant. Uh, a grass forage grower here that also recognized that it might not be the right time to go and pick up the grass. He won't have the same yield next year. So again, these are some of the issues that though we have been talking about this taking care of the soil for many years, this is still practical daily life that, that we end up in a situation where we should have reconsidered maybe going there. Uh, we have a lot of work in Denmark and in Scandinavia on cover crops. So I think that cover crop won't feel that nice. So even though this farmer put in a lot of effort putting in some ryegrass cover crop within his maize, when he went out there trying to get his maize back home, that was maybe not at the right time either. So again, we have a lot of good in uh, initiatives to try and to make a difference here. And I think that is the interesting thing of how can we use technology to be even better at hitting on the right time to go in these fields and also knowing when not to go there. I have a small example of clover grass. I know it's not the biggest crop for you, but for those of you that are doing uh, uh, for, for silage production, for example, and we have been talking about already now, mentioning a couple of times with the controlled traffic, 
this idea of what is the right working width, how is it we are trafficking our field, that I think is an essential to kind of like set out a system for your individual production site, your farm, so that you know, okay, where am I placing my tram lines? Are these tram lines something I want for permanent, or am I doing it only within a certain uh, growing season? Uh, because we know whenever we come with the next machinery, we have a lot of machinery that has to fit together. And that's also where we can say that <coughs> control traffic could be a large investment unless it's something you do as an investment over time and put up a strategy for your farm. So this is where we're kind of like looking at how can we use the technology uh, to look at this. And no doubt GPS and auto steering has made it a lot easier for us to control these machinery. Where are they driving whenever we are in the field? Uh, how can we think about machine combination? So we limited either the area that has been trafficked uh, or, or where we have it. Because no doubt it's the grass, it's the clover grass that makes the uh, profit for you. It's the, where you're being paid. But looking at it, this is a study from uh, one of our uh, neighboring farms where they had this uh, butterfly mower set uh, with an 8.8 .8 meter working width and a rake with a 9.5 meter working width. We could see that when you've been in taking the first cut, you actually had traffic. So this is locked. And then, because they weren't driving with auto steering, this is actually the lockings from four cuts in one season. So it gives a good idea of where is actually the clover grass going to be afterwards. So just the understanding of trying to comprehend the traffic that you're doing over just one season. And then you can say, okay, I want this crop for the next three years. Yeah, uh, the, that crop that's left. And that's really having that understanding uh, of what is it that you are summering up continuously whenever you're driving out in the field. So, these were mentioned, and I, I love this before. I saw this in the breakout session before when we were looking at controlled traffic. The, the consequences of the soil compaction, really looking at water infiltration, if, no matter if we are growing in, a, in an area where we have a lot of water, precipitation, or less, having this effect by the tires is really problematic. And we need to look at what is it that our plant will, will perceive the soil so that we can increase possibility for the root growth so that we have the possibility to catch as much nutrients as possible. So having that understanding, really understanding what is the consequence of what you're doing on a, on a continuous pass understanding. But then also looking at is controlled traffic one way or are we able to actually evaluate different solutions? So a lot is being done right now from also tire manufacturers in looking at how can we develop tires? And I would say from following both Matthias Dettler in Switzerland and some of the university researchers at Aarhus University that are looking into the soil physics, we can see that we can easily go on our land at some times without having any impact on yield. Actually, at least under our soil condition, we've actually seen that traffic also gives us a yield increase. We have some of the micronutrients that are more difficult to get a hold of if the soil gets too loose. So it's not an either or or a one way solution. It's understanding how that heavy equipment is affecting the soil and going with the right tire pressure to the right uh, axle load is important. And that is really where I see some of the new technologies coming in so that we're able to do an adaptive system that continuously fit in to what kind of crop you're driving on, what kind of soil, and then what are the actual load conditions and then adjusting on the go for these systems. I think that is also something that will challenge how we look at control traffic. I think control traffic makes sense when we are really heavy, but not for all operations. And I think that is also uh, important to understand that it is not all operation that has a yield damaging uh, impact on your, on your way of growing. So when we're looking at the soil fertility, at least instead of just using control traffic as having that as an end goal, I think, as anyone, should you look at your 100% of yield or uh, soil, why accepting that you say, okay, 15% or 20% of my yield or soil should not be fertile? That, I think, is an important thing when we look at technologies that we need to have in the future. So, so I don't see the, soil, uh, the control traffic 
as a long-term solution, hopefully. I hope that we would be able to have efficient machinery that simply will not make soil compaction. So the, this idea of not accepting to destroy our soil, I think that should be a core parameter when we are looking at how we should manage a strategy on a long-term perspective. And of course, when putting in a picture here of this little blurry machine up there, I think a lot of things is happening with auto automation. So we don't need large working which to be able to manage a high capacity production uh, where the inputs is uh, matching your, uh, your profit. I think that is where the technology will, will start helping you. So just by mentioning an example here with the robots, that could be one way. But really with, I guess there's uh, a few million dollars of equipment as represented in here. Um, we have already seen, I think, seen some of the most advanced and intelligent solutions within the last hundred years. Um, and I think that might also be something that all of you know. This uh, farmer, I think that actually represents a lot of what we're pursuing. Okay, we can say he might not have the same capacity, but from an intelligent approach to how we're doing the soil, doing operation management in the field, the hands, you know how little small differences you can feel with your hands. He actually had a double load sensor for controlling this individual share, really had a feeling of his soil. Feet, if you're going out kicking the soil, you know, okay, there's a different, what's the moisture today? So that practical farming, being out there, having the feeling of the soil was important. 3D cameras, we still don't have cameras, or only are just emerging to have cameras that are as good as most of your eyes. Um, so the ability to really look at the crop, at the plant, at the soil uh, is important. Doing shear control, so we're optimizing our machine continuously to that site where you're doing it now. Otherwise, that one will tell you uh, how much it's able to pull. We're not just pulling an extra horse in front of it. Uh, we need to do it with what we have. Wireless is not new. We've had that uh, also a long time. So we are sometimes just trying to put it into an ISO standard. That doesn't work that well. Um, online plowing. Um, when we look at online plowing, uh, the first scientific publications on when we had soil compactions due to driving in our, uh, due to plowing, was in 1898. So that was a bit before the tractors. But that was documented that the impact of the horse walking in the furrow had a yield decreasing impact. So I think the soil compaction is not neither something new, we're just trying to get around it in different ways. Biofuel, then, then we're now getting all organic. Um, we, we have very minimal. Those that have ever tried doing this, you know that you'd rather go very long and then doing very few turns because that's energy consuming for the one going behind you to, to do that. And to spin, seeing a horse not being able to pull and implement, kind of like that doesn't work either. So even though this old farmer that were looking at what he was actually doing, and then if you're looking at this and then potentially of such a modern equipment, then we can say, okay, sometimes what direction are we actually pursuing? How are we trying to solve our problems uh, with horsepower uh, and extra energy? I know a lot of you are not doing plowing, uh, but the aspect of how much can we solve by putting extra horsepower in front instead of looking at what is actually the work. And I think an even more important is that driver, where is he now looking? Before we had the skilled farmer going behind evaluating the work, now he's sitting up in front and has to have a better working environment, looking over his shoulder all the time. So we have a lot of our mechanization that has not always made things better. I think it has also introduced new ways of where we say, where do we have the challenges? Of course, not being only pessimistic in this, there's a lot happening in, in, in this future context. So when we're looking at what are the possibilities uh, that you will have in the futures, we can see a satellite coming up here in the, the top corner. Um, we're suddenly getting new ways of perceiving our soil, our plant doing growth, our yields, uh, or our crops uh, close to yields. We have companies coming out selling drone services. What is the information that you can bring back? But also, recently we see a lot of new sensors 
being mounted on the tractors to evaluate whenever we're in the field what is actually the possibilities we have for optimization. I think that we have seen a lot of examples in the last five, eight years on new sensors. I think one of the biggest game-changing approaches we will see now is that we have to look at this in the holistic way. So having all of this data in, and that's really where the computer power, the processing power, are changing the way of how we can optimize this. So when we are looking across an operation, we are able to get infos from satellites and drones weeks and days ahead of being going into the field, but are also able now to start looking at what is the information that we can generate when the machine is going in the field, and if you're not plowing, then the seedbed harrow, so are you evaluating in front of your harrow, and how about looking behind? Actually having sensors that are looking behind, helping to evaluate, documenting, so that when you come with your next operation, you have inputs to how should you actually site-specifically manage that part of the zone. So I think when talking precision farming, we will have a lot more new technologies coming in in the whole crop establishment that will uh, differentiate because now we have computer systems that are able to bring this data real time to you. Of course, when we are looking at fertilizing and spray uh, spraying, a number of technologies has been on the way for a number of years. But now I think where also the new one will be on the combine, are we able to get good quality measures? Do we actually, for that batch in the hopper of the combine, do we have a quality label already before this has left the field? Could we start managing, should this go to silo A, B, or C? Is it something we can sell as a high value protein content uh, feed, or should it have been used just for, uh, for the young animals at home? Uh, that setup, where no matter what machine is driving out there, um, or at what time of the year, all of this data management, I think that is something we will have to learn and understand within the next uh, five years, because we see how many different companies are coming in with different pieces of puzzle. And unless you know how to put it into the big picture, it won't be value adding for you, because it's not only about having an NDVI map, unless you know how to manage it, what is it that you're going to use this data for? And I think that is the problem. So when we are looking then to our fields, trying to explain why do we have spots with bad germination? It might be pests, it might be diseases, it might be a wrong setting of your seed drill, so it didn't go into the right depths. Chasing some of these, I think there's a much higher benefit of looking at how to minimize uh, having these than redistributing of your fertilizer. There is a lot of uh, area that can be yield optimized if we're looking, trying to find out why is that bad germination. And I think that is one of the places where data will start helping us in understanding what is actually going on within our field. And as your farms are growing bigger and bigger, there was a difference when you could manage a couple of hundred acres in your head and knowing, okay, you had a soft spot just on the north side of the, the farm with having hundreds of fields or thousands of acres. We, we have an, a data overload on our mind that we can't handle all of this without using the computers. Because no matter how we're looking at it, back to the agron agronomy, we would like to have the seed place right, but did our technology, did we have a seed drill that pushed old residues down to the, that? Did we use too much pressure, as also mentioned this morning, that could we, are we compacting around the seed? Uh, are we ensuring that the depth is, is right uh, or too deep? What is actually the factors that, that helps this small seed to optimize its potential? And no doubt that we, we have all the theory, we have seen this a number of times, but how often are you looking into your machine supplier and looking at, okay, what are the arguments that he's trying to use when he's selling you some hardware whenever we are looking at this? Uh, in that context of the system that you are uh, farming. A couple of interesting things we saw from uh, uh, Agrotechnica in uh, Hanover, Germany here in the autumn. We had Puttinger that had now put in a sensor. So between the PTO, uh, Harrow, and they had put in a camera and then they had the seed drill. So the idea here is that that camera was continuously evaluating the aggregate structure did you actually put too much power into your PTO harrow? So did it destroy the clots, uh, the aggregates of the soil? 
and then had an active feedback loop. So again, these sensors are, are emerging in your machinery so that, that if you have a machine setting that is wrong to just cover all of your heterogeneous field, a lot is emerging that can help with this onboard control. Uh, it could also be in a, uh, this is a, a grow from where we're doing experiments with uh, uh, sugar beets. Uh, so again, the seed bed is an important thing here. And making a faint feedback loop uh, on such a machine, ensuring that how does the tines, et cetera, fit in, that is where there's a, put a, a tremendous amount of research into evaluating this kind of technology so you have much more intelligent feedback on your machinery. Uh, different shares, how are they disturbing the soil? We also know how will the speed affect it. So we see what is actually the operation that we would like to obtain and how can we do this? So looking at how machine industry today are invested in this, there's so many resources put into this and that's also important why I think such a conference like this where the knowledge sharing is important because that's what enables you to ask the right question next time you're out doing an investment. Mechanical weeding is really being discussed a lot in Europe. Uh, as some of you may have heard, we had a, a very heavy debate in uh, late autumn on glyphosate that we were having actually very close, I think, to having a political um, opinion that we should have a ban on glyphosate. It wasn't a lot of uh, scientific result that would be discussed, it was a discussion on feelings. So how is that also driving uh, product, uh, product development uh, to ensure, okay, how can we use it? Not only for bad, I think glyphosate, if it's in or out, I think the debate has showed that looking at how can we also use maybe principles that is used today in organic farming. So this is from a, a research project a large European research project where they showed they were actually able to do mechanical weeding from row widths of 150 millimeter, 15 centimeters, and of course up to the 75, in a, also in a conventional context. So looking at mechanical weeding as also one of the tools that can help in understanding how is it that we're not only spraying ourselves out of it, do we have more tools in our toolbox to solve a certain problem? So when looking at how all this development, coming with one of the areas where I think we, you will see the biggest development within the next five years is within camera technologies. So I brought here an example of a, a camera where the development uh, from these projects has showed that instead of having it only on your sprayer, but basically whenever you're out there, so whenever a machine is in the field, it is looking at what is the variability how much weeds is there? Where do you have the potential for spraying? And then doing the whole data chain automatically. And I think it, it's nice to see where at machine exhibitions today that all this data connectability is, is being softened up. We see much more possibility today to have this automatic data transfer. I think that's one of the important thing in this that you're not running around with USB sticks in your pocket because they never get it back to the home office uh, or often then they're filled with dirt when you have to put in the USB stick. So utilizing technology here, and the fun thing of this project is that it's all using consumer products. So you have a camera of only a few hundred dollars, uh, you are using an app for the data transfer so that it, it has an easy way of uh, being applicable all over. Uh, instead of building in SIM cards and so on, you, most of you are running around with a high-speed computer in your pocket, and that can actually also be used when you're out in the tractor. So having that automatic feedback loop, so maybe we can say, yeah, we would like to recognize individual species of weeds and be able to target them with a targeted sprayer, but right now, how can we actually use such knowledge instead of waiting for the scientists coming with a 99% solution, could we already gain now the first 20, 40% savings by using imagery to tell you, okay, which fields should you go and manually investigate? Which fields can we already see now? Here you have an inf infection problem. Go there whenever you have a window of opportunity. Because we never, no, we, we never have all the days in a row where we need to go spraying. We always need to do a prioritization in the practice. And having farm management systems that are now starting to enable a support so they can say, okay, 
these five fields is the ones that you should choose to prioritize next time you have a window of opportunity. That's where you have the best payback. This is technology that I'm sure you will see within the next uh, just few years. And an example of this from, from the project is that we had this camera out to evaluate the weed intensity uh, in front of the tractor. Then I know as soon as, as creative farmers get new technology, they always use it in a different way than engineers were planning. But this was actually quite an interesting way because this farmer, he mounted the camera. So instead of looking in front, he was just looking behind the header to see how his cover crop was emerging. Because after that dusty cloud had distributed all his residue, it would take him four, five, six days before the cover crop would go through the residue and he would actually be able to see if he had a robust uh, establishment of his cover crop. So by looking here, he, he saved one week to actually know how well is his cover crop established. So being able to have that, and when he's coming back from home in the evening, being out harvesting, both he has a yield map, but he also now has a, a map of how well established was his cover crop. So he know, okay, which field do I have to monitor to ensure that, okay, they weren't well established, I need to do something differently, or I won't assume to have the same effect of my cover crops. So when looking at it, the, the idea of, of that camera was evaluating the weed in between the plant rows. Uh, then for, from this, you could have a camera on each side of your sprayer boom to give that continuous evaluation. But turning it around, then just getting an average uh, of data. That was one way of automating the data storage. So when you came back home, you could actually look at all this variability. And that is why I think also the reason why you're here, because you're actually seeking out a lot of this knowledge and being able to look at how can we also do this in a more automated way because you don't want to make more work than uh, requested. That is where some of this technology can come in. And of course, when we are then looking at what is developed, what, what kind of uh, possibilities are camera development uh, offering, then we can say, okay, sometimes when we see some of these demos on cameras mounted on sprayer booms, we can see they're talking about six, eight kilometers driving speed going in the field. I would guess most of you are driving at least a double. So that was why we, we took this as part of it. Uh, it's an unknown PhD student driving without a helmet. But uh, notice the, the speedometer, because we were out testing some of these cameras. So we, uh, as soon as if you give an ATV to a young boy in this case, then, then he will automatically do like this. So I think we're ending up at, at around 60 kilometers per hour. And then we are looking behind at the moment. You can see the flash going off. So that that's the they are testing one of these cameras for in-field mapping of weeds. This is a picture taken with 60 kilometers per hour. So it kind of like shows you how far are we actually ahead with camera technology. At least it's not your speed anymore that will do the limit in this. So this is technology that is available today. And of course, what we need to learn is now, are we looking at the residue? Are we counting how much uh, crop germination? Are we looking at the weeds? And of course, are we starting to be able to map out these weeds? Artificial intelligence is really helping. And we can see a large number of different companies, especially also the large chemical companies, that are chasing uh, these artificial intelligence solutions to help being able to identify the weeds. So you can say, OK, what is actually not only the amount of weed you have in there, but what type of weed it is. So instead of just telling that it's a dicot or a grass weed, uh, in which uh, conditions are you actually able to start monitoring this and map these out. So this is a, a mustache uh, in a, a cereal, so of course unwanted. But it's extremely high accuracy that we see the performance of a lot of these systems. And that's where the combination of using this artificial intelligence with high-speed cameras will go and make a new level of data that you have to have. And that's again where as soon as you'll be sitting at home being able to map out and see, OK, are we looking at our mayweed uh, or the speedwell spe speed uh, as wheat, or how is your rapeseed uh, established? So when you have all of these layers of data, we can see out there there are also other uh, suppliers of this kind of technologies that would like to help you manage the exist data. We can see both big and smaller uh, suppliers of this are coming into the market. And the more you start learning to see, okay, how is the value coming of this whenever you're looking at your high number of fields, that's where uh, this is something where you can use it, not only to look at 
that individual spot. But if you have a field with high intensity, you know, okay, these are the ones to prioritize. And that's where, instead of this just ending up as nice color pictures at your office wall, that is where you also need to start putting up demands to your suppliers of these, because it's not the color maps that makes a difference. It's as soon as it's been transferred into a decision support system that would help you prioritize the fields based on criteria that you're putting up. And that, I think, is something that you also need to know. You have an extremely high impact on your dealers and suppliers of this. Tell them what you need, because we've had color yield maps for the last 25 years with very little profit. And of course, we need to ensure that we're not just adding on another color map, but we can see the value of this before you do an investment into this technology. Another example, just to show you how far we get. So when we have such a picture of uh, a clover grass, and those of you, you would see there, there's also some uh, weeds in between. So this is image analysis done by artificial intelligence to map out what is the ratio of clover and grass. There's a huge difference in how these fields should be fertilized, depending on this. Uh, so we've seen the first commercial system being launched, launched here in spring uh, in, in Scandinavia, where you have uh, the software for drones to fly over your field, map them. Data is transferred automatically. And you're not just ending up with this map, but you're ending up with a receipt for how should you actually fertilize. And the first experiment they presented from last year showed that in some of these clover grass, on a farm basis, they were able to increase yield with between 8 and 10%, simply by redistributing fertilizers within some of these forage uh, products. And that again is how is it that this mixture, how are we fertilizing a mixture? And I think that was very interesting to see this morning. What kind of mixtures are we starting to see? How would that affect our fertilizer strategy? So I think there's a lot of ways that we can see, depending on if one crop is better established than the other, how should we then also do an adaptive fertilizer strategy when we then come back into the field? There's a lot of new ways we are trying out uh, with this whole approach of having intercropping and multiple different crops in the same field that could be helpful. From research perspective, there, there are extremely high correlations published now between what the camera sees and then what, uh, um, what is the actual uh, chemical composition or analysis results from such uh, pictures. So looking at such a, a thing where you have a 90% confidence interval and looking at, at different uh, clover fraction in kilo dry matter over a lot of different fields, um, that we can see these systems are actually achieving a high robustness. That is really due to this high processing power that we, we see in, in these new products. So ways where we are using cameras, but not just to give you the picture where you have to stitch pictures together at home, or then you look at a large uh, aerial photo, basically, but where you will have these management systems. Uh, that is one of these systems where I would say the major difference here will be in farm management system, not in hardware that you're buying out in the field. It has to come back home into your office and bring a value. Um, some of you might have a drone. Uh, this is from a, a farmer that were trying the same algorithms out for us. So he had a Phantom 4 drone. So this, he was testing out from uh, our National Agricultural Advisory Service an app where he were able to fly out over the field, take pictures with a Phantom 4 drone, which I would say is in the high end of a hobby drone. It's not by far in the price range of a professional drone. The images that you're able to obtain by even uh, hobby toys today is something that, that can bring the same value. So the result when these images were analyzed, even having such a drone flying around in five meters height, could actually give substantial information down to leaf level of what were available in, the, uh, in your field. So I think that's also where it, we are not necessarily talking extremely high investments. Uh, I think a Phantom 4 drone would roughly be somewhere around $2,000, uh, uh, guessing right, I don't know, roughly. And, and the amount of data that you can actually be able to achieve with such a hobby product uh, is quite interesting when we have looked at what has been the entry rate on investment uh, previously. But also, 
I would put up a, a remark for, for what is it that we're also looking at from automation point of view. Um, robots uh, that are under development, we know right now we have in Europe 23 different companies trying to develop agricultural robots. So this, the investment within this business is extreme. Um, and the idea of what is it that it enables, as soon as you can take out a driver from the cabin, maybe put him somewhere else where he's surveying uh, the field, it opens up for whole new ways of looking at how your machine pays back. Because if you have a 16-row cedar that can be chopped into four and let them drive on its own with much less weight, what are the capacities that you can actually have? Uh, so this is from an uh, automatic field experiment uh, in Denmark, where we, uh, we were both in uh, with cereal seeding and also <coughs> here where they were just testing for, for maize seeding. But I think it shows some of the potential that we have been chasing larger and larger working widths to have a high capacity. But basically having four or five or eight of these running around gives you also the flexibility because you know if your big machine stops, you go from 100% capacity to 0% capacity. Having one of these stopped, it gives you much more flexibility in being able to maintain, refuel, refill without the whole fleet is standing still. So that way of thinking automation into practice, I think is something that you would also need to look at when you would be uh, looking at an investment strategy for the next five, 10 years. Because should you invest in a tractor pulled machine today, and how long time do you expect to have a payback for that machine? Um, because one thing is that we're pursuing larger working widths, and one thing is, of course, also the, the advancements that is happening within this one. So that is where looking at what is the expectation, when do you think the robots will be there? Could you do a large investment in a new tractor fleet, knowing that you have to have them at least 10 years, to be able to sell them? And when do you think robots might be relevant for you to consider in your investment strategy? No doubt, you will find a lot of uh, engineers driven by technology development or companies driven by technology development that will give you all the nice arguments why you should go in this way, but also looking at what is actually the potential. This is from a field experiment performed by what we have as, uh, in Denmark called the Danish Technological Institute. It's a governmental-owned uh, test and certification unit. But they were actually doing a commercial comparison so any sprayer manufacturer could sign up, uh, where here they were testing the repeatability of your spot spraying on commercial available technologies that has already been sold for Danish farmers. So four different sprayer manufacturers signed up for such a one to demonstrate that they all were given the same map and then they just put in uh, water uh, with, they were, it was colored with the same color as you have in your red sausages if you buy that. But that was, so that it's not painting, it's at least de decomposable. Um, but that was an easy way to actually evaluate how was the repeatability, the accuracy and the performance of state of the art machine available out there. So I think, a lot of this technology is out there. We, we need to start learning how to use it. Um, and we also saw in some of these that not all machine manufacturers were performing equally. Uh, and that is also an important knowledge for you to have because this is expensive equipment. So you need to know in which direction to put your money. Auto steering. Uh, we've had for the last almost 14 years an ISO standard on testing auto steering performance. Uh, we don't have anywhere in the world where these auto steering tests are being performed to actually certify according to this ISO standard. But the standard has been existing for 14 years. Uh, now we see DLG in Germany together with the Danish Technological Institute are actually starting to build the first test, but it won't be operational. It takes more than 15 years from anyone had agreed on the ISO standard on how to test before the, the test rig was actually uh, uh, a reality. Because auto steering, and though anyone would say it's running RTK DPS, and that, that means you would have a, a sub-inch accuracy, there's still a lot of differences within the different brands. And that's one, also something where, when are you as farmers requiring that you have a second opinion on your investment? Because you're putting a lot of money into these areas. So it is also something that 
will help in a global scale that a lot of people are pulling in this direction. And of course we know it's only scientists that are drawing out a rectangular field. This, is, this could be practice, and I saw some of the fields, field map we saw here, that's not only a unique Danish field, but the problems, I think, are, are generic. It's something we know all over the world. So we have obstacles in the field, we have headlands that are in uniform, and I think the precision farming will move to how is it that we gain much more out of these regions in the field, which we have defined as uh, headlands. We are good at using our equipment in the mainland, but also ensuring that our headlands uh, will not be forgotten. That is one of the things where I think the position technologies will really also make a difference within the coming years with spraying technologies like this. So that was uh, the talk. I went through the, the soil fertility, uh, continuing some of the comments you had from the morning. Uh, also looking at your, the soil erosion, which I think is, is an important thing. Uh, how is that our mechanic uh, uh, machines are affecting the soils. Uh, farming in the future, one example, but again, that's, it's easy to guess about the future. It's much more difficult when you invite me in 10 years and say, okay, that wasn't what happened. Um, but then we can say, okay, I need to have someone else validating uh, whatever technology that you're purchasing, and then hopefully that will help you make an investment uh, that will be the right profit and right choice for you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the group here? If you do pass around the cards, pass them up. I have a question while we're waiting for a few to come up. Uh, what part of the world, we're always looking from our perspective, what countries or, or what regions are the furthest ahead in, in technology and how to impact agriculture? I'm, I'm very happy to come here to Canada to see how far you are at. Um, because I, I really think when, when I'm looking at a European context, um, there's so much difference just between, within Europe on how technology is being driven, simply due to po uh, political agendas. Uh, and I think that's, that's where a lot of these technology manufacturers, they are working on a global scale. So what we see of innovations here on the North American market versus uh, in, in Europe and in Australia, we are in a world now where technology is easily adapted with easy sharing of knowledge over internet. So I think as soon as a company can smell money in this, they are fast in moving it around. And then you have different, I think, uh, I'm honored on seeing how high soil fertility is on the agenda here. I would hope to have some of the same priorities in, in the North European Scandinavian discussion where they are looking much more into uh, nutrient management comparable. Uh, we have a question from the audience here. Uh, I see lots of very uh, intensive, very long-term tillage in Denmark. What are the organic matter levels in, in forest and field soils, soil quality? So they're just trying to understand a little bit what, what the soil structure and soil is like in Denmark when we're seeing lots of tillage in all the slides. I think we have a much heavier tillage approach. So the use of conservation tillage, strip tillage, is still a minimum. Uh, a rough guess right now is that we will be working with something between 25 and 30 percent that are doing some kind of reduced tillage approach. Otherwise, it's still very heavily plowed. Um, and that, I think, is a, is a lot of energy wasted uh, for inappropriate uh, soil use. Okay. Uh, so that, that's really where I think a lot can be learned from what is happening here on the North American. But I think then the, the nutrient management might be something where, where there are other technologies that can be adopted the other way. Okay, appreciate it. I'm gonna uh, hold the questions there because uh, Uli will be back in this session here, in this room, uh, in a little bit here. Just kind of giving you marching orders as we go forward. We're gonna go to another farmer to farmer breakout session. Again, you have one of the five to choose from. Uh, we're gonna be, uh, Uli's gonna be in here talking about upcoming technology. Jay's gonna look after that session. We're going to have uh, Dr. Chris Nichols is around in room two on, on microbiology to regenerate soil. The shop modifications, uh, Dave McEachran's uh, presenting there in room three. Cover crop and intercropping. Uh, again, that's uh, Derek and Tannis and Woody's going to look after that. And the fifth room will be uh, Roller and 
roller crimping uh, with Todd White and Dustin's going to look after that session. Just as far as where we're going here, we're going to have that session, we're going to have a break, so the doors will be open up, we'll have a break, then we'll get you back with the belt into another session, and we'll all be back in here at 4.30 when we come back for the last group session. So go to your next session, we'll open the doors, give you the break, and carry on from there. No.